Okay. I'd like to call the Committee of the Whole Budget Meeting of December 2nd, 2019 to order. Um, I'd like to begin by reading a safety notice. In the event of an emergency, please evacuate council chambers to the nearest exit through the chamber doors and obey all instructions given. And if assistance is required, please see the clerk. And tonight's clerk is Rebecca Mackay. Rebecca, can you make yourself known in case of an emergency? So we will be following Rebecca out. Once you have evacuated the building, please gather in front of parking lot outside of Town Hall. Please note Town of Lincoln Committee and Council meetings are posted on our YouTube channel. I would like to thank the public for attending the meeting this evening, and I just want to remind everyone of our rules for engagement to please be respectful while others are speaking and to please refrain from clapping. Please remember to keep all your cellular devices silenced. Uh, role of Council, everyone's here this evening. Staff are in attendance. Are there any declarations of interest? Okay, I see none. So tonight our budget deliberations will be focused on the department budgets. We continue to build a budget that reflects the needs of our community. Aligning with our capital budget, our operational budget is based on growth. We say it often, but growth is an essential factor when deliberating budget and building a solid foundation for the town of Lincoln. Our community is projected to grow over the next 10 years to bring us to approximately 32,000 people. That's a 50% increase. As we grow and evolve, we must address the budget pressures that come with that change. Lincoln has doubled its, in its construction value since 2017, which means that the more construction results in more infrastructure and more people. So the infrastructure needs to grow to keep pace with the growing population. And the population then brings service demand. So the key to all of this is a municipal operating budget. In addition to growth, the 2020 budget drivers need to account for community expectations of service levels, address investing in our people, such as a living wage, and support council's investment in tourism and economic development. We face a continued reduction in all other sources of funding at a provincial level. We've seen that how the OMPF was well over a million dollars and is now about $250,000 and continues to, to uh, be reduced in things put upon the residential taxpayer. So we've got to come up with local solutions to, in order to maintain our service levels. Even with these changes, Lincoln remains one of the most affordable communities in Niagara when you consider property taxes and household incomes. Tonight as we deliberate, I encourage members of council to keep a focus on supporting operations that will execute work and maintain service levels expected by our community. So there's no statutory public meetings on tonight's agenda. We have three delegations. Please note that the order of delegations has been amended this evening. So, 20 Valley Tourism Association will speak first with all other delegations to follow. Please note that each delegation will have five minutes. The clerk will have the timer on. And we've got Justin Downs pinch hitting for Matt Giffen that had to go pick up his daughter out of town. So welcome, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, Council. Uh, thank you for allowing to us report on the 2019 uh, 20 Values of Tourism Association. Uh, my name is Justin Downs, as Councillor uh, Patrizia said. Uh, so this year was um, uh, a good year. We, uh, we had some new replacement uh, board members come on. Uh, we had some more new executive uh, changes. We, uh, Matt Giffen came on as our treasurer. Uh, where he, uh, because um, uh, Len had actually removed that seat, he, uh, he stepped down from the board after uh, a, lo a long, uh, um, uh, long uh, tender on the board. Uh, so recent changes at TVTA, um, through some much needed uh, TVTA um, uh, vision, uh, we'd, uh, we had to look at uh, lean organization. We had to do some cost cutting measures, and you'll see, uh, and we'll talk about that in the next few slides. Uh, board financial transparency. As Matt came onto the board, he uh, wanted to go with the financials, and we went through the financials uh, tooth and comb. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we focused on delivering uh, an experiential visitor experience, uh, ex exceptional visitor experience. Um, especially with our flag shop, uh, flag uh, stone of. Um, 
event like Winter Wine Fest, we wanted to make sure it was different or differentiated from any other ice wine events. Also, our possible programs, we want to achieve a, a superior experience through those, um, and I think that we have achieved that. Consistent branding look and feel. I know in the past years, some concerns from council was the that uh, we had some inconsistent messaging uh, through our marketing material. Uh, so with our new uh, executive director, Wendy, we've tried to make sure that that brand look and consistency feel. It's about consistent messaging, language, colors, logos, design, imagery for all the events cohesively to help our message be more compelling and create a deeper arrangement with the consumer. Also, we uh, build new partnerships. So build, we're always going on, on building new partnerships by connecting with Ontario Craft Wine, uh, Wine Association this year. The Ministry of Tourism, Linda McLeod, the, uh, allowed us to sit on a panel discussion to talk about our, uh, our, our, our financial ch uh, challenges and troubles throughout uh, the ongoing years. And uh, we also came with White Oaks, opening and considering a new membership to TVTA, and I know that's going to speak directly to uh, the accommodation um, uh, situation in our area, or lack there of accommodations. Financial transparency. So the one thing that we did this, uh, this year is that we sat down and we really fine combed our, our budget. We went through uh, line by line to figure out what was going on, what we were spending, uh, where we were spending wrong, and found out there was a lot of uh, overlapping spending. We did some corrections. Uh, um, I call it smoke and mirrors sometimes. You know, we were putting some, uh, some f fees where they shouldn't be. We're double feeding or something, especially inside our events. We're taking some money out of committee fees and putting them in. So we really wanted to make sure that we had a clear, transparent picture for our better members. So understanding the future of uh, the TVTA and how we can do some changes uh, to make sure that we're uh, sustainable for the future. Uh, we cut staff overhead by 50%, so we were three, then we were two last year, and now we're one with only one executive director running it uh, four days a week. Uh, and we're also using a third-party uh, half-day bookkeeper to help us keep uh, the financial uh, transparent. We are finding when we ongoing uh, transition from an ED or general manager that it was getting to be um, a little bit um, confusing and we weren't getting the right message, so we did that. We cut off expenses by going down to one office. We shifted marketing dollars to digital. By shifting marketing dollars to digital only for wrapped up, we were able to spend less and target our audience more precisely without going to radio, buy and ads, old school paper ads, uh, and allowing us to actually sell more tickets. So we found that, that uh, we were less spent on the marketing dollars in digital, uh, we actually spent some more tickets. Uh, we, sh uh, we did this, we negotiated terms with some of our AP partners because we had to look uh, really into our AR list and AP list and look at who uh, we owed money to and contacted those necessary that we couldn't pay all, uh, right away to create some terms with them to make sure they're happy that uh, they were for, uh, sustainable for our future. Uh, and again, we did all this to make sure that we were sustainable for the future. We're great, and we're also grateful for the support from the Town of Lincoln and the ongoing support over the years. Um, without, uh, without the runway that you've given us in that financial, we wouldn't be here today. Um, 2019 Town of Lincoln funding. The net contribution is wrong here. I do apologize. There was this mistake. It's actually $69,416. Uh, and that was the net for TVTA uh, minus the Todd signs for $2,712 and the $7,500 that we provided to Crystals in the Village and Marketing Campaign. Funding goes directly to the Todd signs and JVC, leaving the net amount of $69,416. Briefly, what TVTA uh, delivers. Uh, we deliver a management program and ex execution of three annual events that would be wrapped up in the Valley, Get Fresh, those are our password programs, and Winter Wine Fest, our flagship uh, ice wine festival campaign that we have in January. Annual visitor guides to members, tourist outlets, business, and Ontario travel centres. Uh, member services manages a consumer, uh, customer-facing website, inclusive member listings, ongoing calendar events, updates, and handles visitor calls. Requests, emails, inquiries, uh, organized committee and board meetings, including agendas, um, agendas, sorry. Invitations, uh, reminders, take meeting minutes, diversity members and social media marketing events to manage relationships, administration, application with funding partners like the TPN, celebrate Ontario, designs, distributes a monthly newser, announcing member events of 6,000 consumers, and also manage the office and all the administration functions. As well, we do marketing communications for all our members and consumers. 
The first passport that we do is in June. Uh, it's Get Fresh in the Valley. Uh, 227 passports we identified through our event manager that's uh, managing the uh, wrapped up that that can grow uh, uh, slightly. A uh, net revenue of $7,000. Uh, this year we're doing radio, uh, last year we did uh, marketing radio, print, and digital. Uh, net revenue was down 40% versus 2018. This year's wrapped up in the Valley campaign. Uh, we did 2,100 passports sold. It was a net revenue of 35,000. We did 100% of that digital marketing and we saw an increased revenue of 15% over 2015. And that's where we see that we, uh, going solely to uh, digital marketing, we could uh, uh, precisely uh, target and allow us to have um, uh, increase the sales. Uh, 20, uh, 20 Valley Winter Wine Fest 2020 highlights. Uh, new messaging differentiate WWF. Uh, Niagara's bout, uh, best outdoor street party. Dress for the occasion, have a true outdoor Canadian experience. So we're changing the messaging slightly uh, from other uh, ice wine events because I think that we have a superior event compared to Niagara Lake and Niagara Falls. Um, best local, so this year, instead of hiring a, a celebrity chef, we're using our best local chefs, create award-winning wines, MC, TV personality, Kevin, top local talent, and on-stage local talent. So this year, we are going to go towards more local talent, uh, aggressive sponsorship goals, confirmed as GGO, Vintage Inns, Lakeview Equipment, uh, Courts Holding, Casino, Whammo, and White Oaks as a new sponsor. Um, we're heavily focused on digital and marketing influences. Some of, the, uh, some of the highlights for that campaign, uh, instead of doing a local chef, we have a top local chefs, uh, uh, Eric Peacock, the chef on the 20, Rick and Olivia from um, uh, Westcott, myself, uh, leading uh, two themed dinners, our, our themed dinner and a brunch dinner, curated, uh, uh, but we're also gonna have award-winning wines from around uh, 20 Valley, and that will be uh, appearance by winemaker of the year, David Johnson from uh, Featherstone. MC TV personality Kevin, Thirsty Travel and Iron Chef will be our MC and our MC for the event. And then we'll continue to uh, highlight that local talent M LMT connection, Postman, Figure Four, Froggy Man, Hogtown Boys, and improve the village uh, uh, configuration schedule of activities. Today's reality, 20 Valley, uh, 20 Valley Tourism is a member-based event management organization. The business model is not sustainable as we see fit. Um, however, that's not all bad news. Um, seeing the presentation today from our uh, Mike Robbins and Paul, uh, we strongly believe that that is the future of tourism. Uh, we fully support that as the future, uh, uh, as the future of tourism. Um, uh, I fully support as the board member. Um, of course, we'll have to have that conversation with our board team, uh, our, our board, uh, um, uh, at our next board meeting, but I'm sure that majority of them or most of them or if not all of them will be behind this. Um, we, sorry. 20 Valley is basically operating as an event management based uh, organization. This business model has remained the same for the past 10 years. This model is not financially stab uh, stab uh, sustainable and it has lim limited potential to grow uh, as we are right now. I would like to make it clear though, this is not all bad news. The destination has more authenticity, authenticity uh, and charm in other regions. TV, uh, TVTA has more core assets like kilometers of uh, hiking, bike trails compared to other good wineries. Like I'd like to say on Harold's part, uh, or, or agree with Harold, we have the craft beverage community, we have the culinary, we have all the other assets. We just need to uh, find the potential way to get or leverage our visitors to come here. Um, thank you. Fantastic, Justin. I just had the hook about to give you, but we're okay. And I was, give, I was giving you a little bit that of, five minutes? No, I was giving, five minutes. well, you're bordering on 10, but I was giving you a little leeway, birthday boy, and we had to sit through the first three hours of the meeting. So it's okay. it's the role of the chair perfect. is to it's give you okay. a little bit, a little bit of strength. Plus you're a Leaf fan, so I like you. Any questions from committee. Mary Easton. Can we go back to the financial sheet, the sure. numbers? Sure we can. Do I do that? Okay. There we go. Okay. So could you just, um, um, through you, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. uh, Justin, would you just explain this sheet again? You were pretty quick and 
I don't think I caught Through it. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, of course, Mayor Easton. Uh, so we have an annual membership of $24,960.50. We also have additional um, sponsorship support uh, for 2019 of 17500 uh, 17, the 2019 is paid uh, Todd's Highway signage that's paid uh, by the town to, I believe, the region um, of $2,712. So the total uh, uh, support for 2019 was $45,120.50. But okay. then there was additional marketing, uh, marketing support that was approved in the June, uh, I believe it was the June uh, board, uh, council meeting for marketing support for the TVTA. So there was 17,500 or 7,500 that was approved to go for additional marketing support for Christmas Village that went to the JVC committee, uh, Jordan Village committee, um, that was uh, for Christmas in the Village. Additional 7,500 uh, for wrapped up in the Valley and an additional 7,000 for 2020 Winter Wine Fest uh, support. And then there was economic development support of uh, 12,500. So for a total of 34,500. Okay. Um, and I made a mistake or we made a mistake of the border. Uh, minus the JVC that went straight to JVC committee and the Todd's it was uh, 69,000 that was a net to TBTA in 2019. Okay, 69,000. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, um, so the first section under 2019 Winter Wine Fest support, that was from the town, correct? Correct. 2019 Winter Wine Fest support, what was the source of that 17,500? Mm -hmm. So, so the 17,500? Chair, uh, to the mayor, everything listed on this on this sheet here was actually town funding. Oh, okay. Uh, so if, right. you, if you recall my previous presentation where I was talking about tourism and the $100,000 that we have in base budget moving forward, this is what I was referring to. Uh, okay. In addition, if you recall, there was some money that was set aside for some gateway signage, uh, but this is the, that is the amount. So everything that you see up here was town funding to the TVTA uh, or in-kind contributions for 2019. Okay. All right. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Let's see where that goes. Can you turn, thank you, thank you, Worship. Councillor McCulloch. Uh, thank you, Chair Patrieva. Just, um, what does TODS stand for? Are these in acronyms? Just curious what uh, TODS stands for. Um, tourism records. Uh, through you, Chair, it, it stands for uh, Tourism Oriented Directional Signage. Okay. Uh, and it is a, a program from the, the Ontario government uh, for those highway signs that you see on the, on the QEW. Okay. And then, uh, if I may, like, mm -hmm. there, there's another an acronym um, on page 8, TPN to add free digital outdoor billboards in Hamilton. Who's TPN? So uh, through you, Chair, TPN is the Tourism Partnership of Niagara. Uh, it is Niagara's uh, regional tourism or organization, so RTO2, uh, as set forth by the provincial government. Uh, if I may, one more question. Mm -hmm. Just Go ahead. Re you know, regarding the attendance and the um, dependence on numbers, and uh, the event that was held in April was weather a factor in that? What was the? W do we just look at numbers, and uh, do we do we look at the weather? Do we look at other factors that may or may not influence attendance to an event? I, I recall spring coming, you know, having a late start. If um, through you, Mr. Chair. Are you referring to the Get Fresh in the Valley Passport Program? Yes. Yeah, so that one's always weather dependent. We, always, uh, we never know, and I believe spring was late this year, so when um, we had the late winter, so I think the passports on the, the first weekend were a little low, and then we recovered uh, on the second weekend, but not as much as we would have to exceed the numbers of 2018. Okay, and, and not, not I'm just, uh, I like the digital marketing. I think the price is right on that. Like, you know, to, to get people talking and to get people sharing, um, I'm all for that. So I, I, I like that. But I, th I think November, the weather was a lot better and that, that may play a part into. The, the other thing uh, through Mr. Chair, um, uh, Rapid in the Valley has been around for a few more years. Okay. 
So it is, there was the original Passport the program that we had, so it has that loyalty still. Um, we're still growing Get Fresh in the Valley, but yes, you're right. Um, it is uh, weather dependent, and it's also coming off of two Passport programs from other area events, uh, like Ice Wine Festival from a Niagara Wine Festival, and then Niagara and Lake does their chocolate and uh, red wine through February and March. So, it might be a little saturated. Uh, fall comes off. There's no previous possible programs other than just the Grape and Wine Festival that runs uh, during Grape and Wine Festival. And there's a nice little monthly break between it. Um, but yeah. And if, I, if I may, just, um, I, just some feedback when I was speaking to some people. Um, when they were coming to these events, they were coming again the following weekend. They had such a great time um, the, the first week. They discovered the, the 20 Valley, the wineries, and this and that, and uh, they were coming again uh, without an event scheduled or planned just because they got a taste of what was going on. So I, I think these are successful programs that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Brene. Thank you, Chair Patrick. Uh, thank you, Justin, for your presentation. I don't imagine when you woke up this morning that you thought you'd be at the mic all by yourself, so uh, kudos to you. Um, so through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Deany. So, so y you've made it clear that basically, you know, the 215,000 asks that we saw in, in, the, in the, uh, the report we saw earlier uh, is a combination of the 100,000 that we've been in on and an additional 115 for a total of 215. But just some clarification through you, Mr. Chair. When Mr. Penichetti was at the mic, he alluded to the fact that he wanted to make sure or at least understand because it sounded like he wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. You know where I'm going. Yep. Can, you, can you maybe clarify where he was going with that in your, in your estimation? Yes, uh, to you, Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, Mr. Penichitti was, was uh, a little incorrect in terms of the $100,000 he was talking about. Uh, he was referencing membership dues. Uh, and, and in fact, the 100000 that I was talking about was this base, but base uh, operating budget. Uh, now, as we move forward with a new tourism strategy implementation team that's going to reformulate uh, the tourism marketing organization, there's still obviously a conver conversation we're going to have in terms of that new marketing or sort of the new uh, stakeholder versus uh, membership model, so a potential hybrid. Okay, I, I'm glad you clarified that because I was of the, yeah. of the, in the camp of the latter, mm -hmm. not where I thought Mr. Panichetti was going, which I didn't understand, so yeah. thank you for that clarification. Okay. See no further questions. Thank you very much, Justin. Okay. And our second delegation tonight is the Downtown Beamsville BIA. So to speak regarding year-end reports, so we've got Stephanie Hicks, the Executive Director. Please come forward and lending a helping hand is the Chairman. Is that your title, Ray? Is Dr. Ray Darchi, the Chairman of the BIA. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for Council, uh, thanks to Council for inviting us tonight and the opportunity to update you on the Downtown Beautiful Bench BIA. For the sake of time, we're going to get Stephanie to uh, start the uh, process and then we'll answer questions afterwards. So thank you very much for having us this evening. I will try and get through this presentation as quick as possible. The good news is, is that it's full of a lot of vibrant uh, photos of things that have taken place in our downtown, so I'm sure you'll appreciate that. Today's presentation, we're going to go through some marketing efforts, our events, sponsorships, beautification, our accomplishments, our amazing students, our voice, all the fields and the future. So marketing, I won't spend a lot of time on this um, unless you're a big numbers nerd like I am. However, we did launch our website this year, March 25th, after we rebranded. And you'll see that since then, we've had 14,646 direct visits to our website. If you have not seen our new website, it does have a sliding web banner that promotes our upcoming uh, events or uh, special weeks that are happening. It does have all of our approved minutes uploaded, our monthly newsletters. It does have a member directory. It's linked to our Instagram. It has our bylaw and reports. And I should also mention it has all of our presentations, including this one. 
We also put ourselves on Google+, Plus, um, which has made a huge difference on how people do find us in the Google world. So currently, if you Google Beamsville, we now sit on page one of Google, which is really important to us. You'll see other numbers there, but in the interest of time, I'm, you can study those numbers while I move on to Digital Main Street. So Digital Main Street was a $10,000 grant that we received to assist our downtown businesses with uh, going digital. So 35 businesses were able to go digital. We were able to hire a student for 16 weeks, and it was their job to be one-on-one -on -one with the businesses. Uh, and their key function was to provide three things, to take 360 photos of the business and upload them to Google Street View, which is actually really cool because if you Google any one of those businesses, I'll give you an example, uh, downtown business Brush, which is a spa. If you Google that and then you see the Street View on Google and double click, it will zoom you right into the inside of the business. So you can literally see the products on their shelves, their chairs, everything they have to offer. Uh, the second role was to assist the businesses with a $2,500 grant opportunity that they could apply for. And uh, that deadline is actually December 31st. So we should get, I, I know there's businesses in the town of Lincoln as they received the Digital Main Street grant as well, but there should be a report coming forward of how many businesses did take advantage of that. And the third role of that student was to provide the businesses with any sort of social media marketing that they may need or give us an indication as a BIA on how we can help that business moving forward marketing wise. More marketing <coughs> um, stats analytics for you. So we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and as of uh, really recently in the last couple of months, YouTube, the purpose of our YouTube channel is just for us to upload interesting webinars of things other BIAs have done. It's a chance for our members to go to YouTube and explore you know, uh, certain things that we find of interest. It's an opportunity for our members to send us information that we can upload on our channel. So it's just bringing everything forward to one destination, one platform for uh, businesses and the public to go and explore. This is where the honorable mentions come in. We did have the opportunity to partner with the Museum and Cultural Center on the display. It was located just outside Council here for um, a couple of months on downtown Beamsville then and, now, uh, then and now. And we also partnered with Community Services on the downtown Beamsville when the tale of the town came. Events. So I will go through our events here. You'll see the ones with the asterisk. Those are events that we did partner with the uh, town of Lincoln on. First of all, covered the Beamsville Farmer's Market and the 2019 season. So it was held Saturday mornings, June to September from eight till noon at the Fleming Center. We had 18 market, markets total. We did actually, there's a correction there, we had 17 because we had to cancel one due to weather. Nine of which of those markets were themed. We did find that if we themed a market, we did get more uh, community traction to come to that farmer's market. <coughs> and we had a minimum of 14 vendors at each market. This is just a feel good photo. Uh, we did collect vendor fees for the, from the, the farmer's market, and any revenues that were brought in were put right back into the farmer's market. We made a decision as a board to ensure that we had an inflatable bouncer at each farmer's market, which uh, there's a heavy cost to that. We made a decision to make sure that we had live entertainment. So that's where our vendor fees went, along with a line item from our own budget. Fling on King, which was a... Um, street festival in downtown Beamsville under the umbrella of Lincoln Rerooted, and that was a huge party. It was a great party, downtown Beamsville. You'll see there the BIA's role, and I would like to, maybe on the theme of the night, it should be a hashtag tonight, um, echo Councillor Brene when he says skin in the game. So the BIA's role there is literally our skin in the game. When, we, when the town partners with us on an event, it's not something that we just show up day of, maybe help out, get a few volunteers. We are involved from start to finish. We, we raise money, we go after in-kind services, we help with the marketing. We are point of contacts for bookings right from the start. You'll see at the bottom there, social media, that was on our Lincoln Rerooted account. These stats here are direct of what the BIA posted in our analytics, community services, or. I apologize, communications did have their own postings, and so those analytics, um, I'm sure communications could provide you, but this is just direct what the BIA did. Communications did a great job on marketing Lincoln Rerooted as a whole and, certain, and the aspects of Fling on King. On this slide, I just want to draw your attention to the picture 
um, on the left. Is it on your left there? Yeah, your left. Um, you'll see the crowd during the day, and then on the right, the crowd in the evening. It's almost it's packed the entire time, just different faces. So the the crowd that was there did a complete turnover based on the entertainment that was uh, happening at Fling on King. Here's just some more um, feel-good photos. The middle photo I really like. Someone asked if it was a stock photo. That's how great it is with the hands. Pumpkin Carving Nights. So the BIA partnered with the Museum and Culture Center. Um, we held a pumpkin carving night to kind of hype up the pumpkin parade, which is the next event I'll talk about. And you'll see there the BIA's role or our skin in the game as far as that event goes. And that was held at a downtown business. It was two sessions, and they sold out within a week and a half. They were completely full. And it was a free event to the community. It cost the people signing up nothing to attend and carve a pumpkin with their family. The pumpkin parade was new this year. It happened on November 1st. It was the opportunity to let your pumpkins shine one more time. Um, so the community, the call out was for the community to drop their pumpkins off. And then the uh, town of Lincoln and the BIA put the pumpkins out on display. It was a great community event. I'll go through some photos as I talk here. You'll see there that we have the approximate number of 300 people. Um, that data was mostly gathered through our uh, I, I in the downtown, Bob the Crossing Guard, because he did cross many families that evening. Um, bottom left there, <coughs> you'll see it's not even dark yet, and the uh, sidewalks of downtown Beamsville are full of families. And we did have five businesses that opted to stay open and pass out candy to any uh, families that came to see all the pumpkins on display. <coughs> oh, Christmas spree, this just happened this past Saturday. It was part of the Tim Hortons tree lighting and also the town of Lincoln's uh, Christmas event. We featured about 45 vendors upstairs. It was a great community event. I don't have the actual numbers on that, but if I had to guess, I would say, you know, 500 to 1,000 people did attend uh, that event. Our vendors were very happy. Most of our vendors, I would say 95% of the vendors were from Niagara region with a heavy backing of ones directly from the town of Lincoln. Um, sponsorships, we sponsored these two events this year, so the Raptors Viewing Party, the Championship Viewing Party, as well as the Agritech Hackathon. Beautification, <clears throat> I will be going through the next slides on what our beautification effort, efforts were this year. Uh, Pitching Canada, so we hosted on April 23rd as part of Earth Week. We teamed up with BDSS High School and the second period of um, that high school, 400 students, we called it the trash mob, and they went into the downtown and literally picked up garbage. And you'll see all the bags of garbage that they picked up. You would be amazed at some of the things that came out of those bags, because then we sorted them and we recycled what we could have. But it's pretty astounding what people just decided to pitch in downtown Beamsville. We were able to get three business sponsors to sponsor that event as well. <coughs> Our Barrels Bloom project, we started it last year when we put out nine Barrels Bloom, and this year we upped that to 20. Uh, this project is put on, we have wineries donate a, a wine barrel to us. Then we have the art students at BDSS paint the wine barrels, and the SHSM, which is the Specialist High Skills Major Horticulture class, plant the barrels. Lights and seasonals. After last year when the lights went in the trees in downtown, uh, the BIA did make a motion to pay for the lighting to be on year-round. It's really important for us. It not only makes the streets more friendly in the evening, but it's also uh, safety-wise, it, it just is more appealing. So it was really important, and we, now we have the lights in the downtown 365 days a year. And our winter greenery, last year 25 were put out, and this year we doubled that order to 50. Accomplishments that we've had. So you'll see there, uh, we've won three awards this year, and also we have been granted two <coughs> different grants. I would like to just address in our 2020 budget, because grants is one number that is also vacant, as well as event revenues, and that's because those haven't happened yet. So although I've applied for grants, I won't actually be able to put what the revenues are if we're successful until we know we're successful. But this year, we um, were successful in two grants, and we were able to hire two students from those grants. 
And that's the, we have had help. So we've had four amazing students um, work for us. In the top left is Erin. Uh, she started her, she completed her 40 hours with us in the beginning of this year and was really hands-on with the Barrels Bloom Project. Next to her on the right is Parker Ward. That was the federal summer student grant. So he assisted with running the farmer's market for eight weeks. Uh, Kean Go was our digital Main Street manager. So he worked for 16 weeks. And currently we have Julia Robinson who just did a bang up job on the O Christmas free market. And in the new year, she'll have to put in 40 hours and we'll be transitioning that to our Barrels Bloom project and other little other things that we have on the go. Our voice, so I'm a director of the board for the Ontario BIA Association. Um, I also sit on the governance committee and the communications committee and I'm the, sub, I'm the chair of the subcommittee for social media. It's been such a great experience being able to have a voice uh, to cover all BIAs in Ontario and make decisions and bring Beamsville to that table in the town of Lincoln. Also, as of November, I've been recently appointed to the 20 Valley Tourism Board. Uh, we just saw in the presentation about tourism-friendly downtowns. It's really important that the BIA has a voice to that. And what's interesting is at one of the stakeholder meetings, this is a really quick story, I promise, uh, they started the meeting out and they said, if the town of Lincoln takes on tourism, where do you see your specific organization in the year 2040? And my answer on behalf of the downtown was basically that if the town of Lincoln does take on more of a tourism role, that's really going to dictate what businesses open in our downtown. We can, it would, you know, take a few years, but we definitely have a downtown where we're surrounded by wonderful wineries. So we, there is a municipality really close to us that has that exact same thing. So I think in the years to come, we'll see a transition to what our bricks and mortar look like in the downtown as far as tourism is involved. These are just the feels. We really love the chalkboard. Um, the community really loves the chalkboard. The, the sunflower drawing there went crazy on social media. We have no idea who the artist is. They just, the chalkboard was cleaned on Friday and they wrote on it, this is blank on purpose. And then by Saturday, that drawing was up. We have lots of other ones. These are just photos that I decided to include in the presentation. Uh, these photos here, after the pumpkin parade, we donated all the pumpkins to Littlefoot Farms and their animals had a feast. Uh, that particular map there is a great artist uh, named Shelly. I'm not even going to attempt her last name right now because I'm talking too fast. But uh, she also created a map for Fling on King. And um, we have her working on something special for 2020 as far as a map of our entire catchment area goes. And there's a, just a picture of a bride and groom that you can't see it, but there was a congratulations writing on the chalkboard there. Here's what the community is saying about us. So these are just a handful of quotes that I pulled from our social media, but you can see like Lincoln Hearing Clinic. They are a downtown business. Thank you so much for your support and kind words. Happy and proud to be a part of the downtown bench. Um, you have, I'm excited about the expansion of the BIA. You folks do great work helping our town look its best and sponsoring community events. I hope we get another Lincoln rerouted this year, which we did, so she was really happy. Um, I love our town. This is a great way to honor them. So, and a lot of people saying, so thankful to live here. What a great town we live in. The future. So the future of the BIA, in addition to the events that we um, host, so we will continue our beautification efforts that we currently have. But here's just some little sneak peeks at the future. We are looking at becoming the second BIA in Ontario to be a B city. We're looking at uh, running this program through our barrels bloom for 2020. Truck traffic, we will continue to be a uh, voice and advocate for our downtown members and work with the town on their voice with the region and all to come together as one on the truck traffic. Uh, 2020 is 50, 50 years, celebrating 50 years of BIAs. So BIAs across Ontario are going to be putting on a BIA week. So you'll see that celebration come out. Parking, we continue to combat parking. Uh, this particular parking lot, you know, we're working with the owners to see how many employees are there, how much parking will need to be had there. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm paving, I'll talk fast. <laughs> um, we're also looking at beautifying the Hickson Street parking lot. So your sneak peeks ahead, I'll be really quick. Uh, we have the alleyway project, there's two alleyways within our downtown, both have uh, been voiced as a cause for concern. Actually the one that connects to the Fleming Center, I just heard our, our AGM, that small cars actually drive through it. So <laughs> that's an issue. 
Um, but we will be looking at beautifying those alleyways. Uh, these particular garden beds, we've already approved to change them. Um, we will be working with the town of Lincoln on, on the flowers and planting, but it is something that we have budgeted for to make sure that we bring more color. As you can see, they're pretty standard and we wanna bring more color into the downtown. Big benches, we have a big bench project that we want to launch. Uh, downtown Meaford BIA and Meaford Tourism and Economic Development have a, it's called their red, big red chair tour. It's huge Adirondack chairs. Uh, we figure we are the bench. And this particular, these particular large benches come from a big bench tour that's in Italy. So we're looking at launching a big bench, a couple of big benches in the downtown. Well, we're close to the end. So I just want to take this moment um, to let the town know how grateful and thankful we are, not only to the town of Lincoln and council, but me personally, I wanted, you know, hands-on. I deal with a lot of the uh, departments here within the town of Lincoln. And uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank economic development, Paul Dianney. Uh, he, him and I meet quite often and uh, his support for the downtown BIA is huge. All of community services under the leadership of Shannon McKay, we're really appreciative of that. Um, Dave Graham has helped us. This at our, our bylaws, Dan Smith was just at our AGM and thank goodness he was there because he was able to answer some questions that I couldn't. Finance, HR helped us with our students, clerks, uh, communications and our CAO Mike Krakopoulos. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody. Oh, and thank you uh, to, to the town and the council for their support. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you remember three and a half years ago, you came to me and volunteered me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, what did we have? We had a defunct website, we had a disgruntled membership, we had a meager budget, we had a small catchment area, we had no buy-in from anybody. And you can see where we've come in three and a half years. It's amazing, so thanks again for all your support. Thank you, Ray and Stephanie. So we've got some questions. Council Rinchima, start us off, please. Uh, not really a question, just a, a a comment, right? It's incredible what you've been able to achieve, and and we just constantly hear about it, about how much there is to do now in 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 Beamsville. <laughs> There's the community feeling is great. People are excited to be here, so thank you. Thank you, Council Russell. Thank you. You stole my thunder, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Um, I, again, thank you for the presentation. Um, and uh, like, catch your breath, because <laughs> you went on for a while. Uh, again, I just want to give you a heartfelt uh, thank you. Again, not even realizing how short of a time frame of where you started to where you are now, and the impact that you have, not only for the businesses in the downtown, but also for the residents. Like, you're like a year-round hug that we all get. And it, I was trying to think of an analogy for what you guys do and the impact you have, and that's the best thing I can come up with. And I just want to say thanks for everything you guys do. Thank you. Vice Chair, you're learning well. You're picking up the lingo. I'm, I'm going to feel completely comfortable letting you sit here next year, so. Mayor Easton. Well, Mr. Chair, I want to say a couple of things. And I had my hand up a minute ago because I, I didn't want um, our um, representatives from the TVTA to leave before um, we, we made a, a comment because we've just had two complete um, stories about transformations that are just hard to believe that have occurred in a year. And so um, I think you're really lucky to be following the TVTA because you both, uh, you know, really historically you've been in the same boat. And so through leadership and just tenacity and, and the ability to, and willingness to dig deep, what we've seen is just a complete turnaround. And so, you know, quite often the town asks itself, you know, um, why should we subsidize anything? And of course, um, as I like to remind the chair, our biggest subsidy is to the biggest interest group in the town, which is hockey, right? And it's appropriate because that's where the interest is and that's where the parents are and that's who's coming to that building. So of course we would subsidize it. So why would we subsidize the TVTA? Well, I can tell you now why we're gonna subsidize TVTA because they know how to dig in and find um, 
the um, ways in which to make money work to their best advantage. And so before you left, I wanted to say that because I've been complaining about you for two years in a row now. So tell, uh, <coughs> tell <laughs> Matt Giffen that um, you're leaving with, um, with good, uh, good news and thank you very, very much. And for you, Stephanie and, and um, uh, Chair, Dr. Ray, you know, the BIA, again, bad news stories time and time and time again. And so now you're not only bringing great joy to yourselves, but even previous members are taking the good news that you're spreading around the town and saying, you know what, all that hard work that we did, it kept things alive. It wasn't pretty, but we kept things alive. And you just come such a long way. And it's hard to believe that this much work could be accomplished by one person. And a person who's also not only bringing the BIA into the forefront, but look at the work that you're doing because of your level of cooperation. So it really matters who you hire. And sometimes when you have a little bit extra money, you can do good hiring. So successful marketing, beautification, award-winning activities, who would imagine? In year one, award-winning activities. It it's just blows your mind. And the whole town has been completely transformed. And I have to tell you that the compliments are just never ending. So you certainly are building revitalization. We may not have every business that we would look at as ideal for an old-fashioned kind of downtown. But in terms of revitalization, it's there. And what will come in the future, who knows? But certainly, it's a major attraction. So we want to recognize that um, the, the BIA levy is set by the downtown businesses through the Board of Directors. And what we're saying with our financial contribution, if uh, everyone agrees, is that we recognize you've come together to make our downtown a destination that we will all take pride in. And in a, it is a small way of supporting our downtown businesses I'm certainly supportive of the financial contribution in the BIA and in Stephanie as um, the representative in the work that uh, you do, Stephanie, for the BIA and also um, as a, you know, the synergies with the town. So that's the kind of a statement that you want to be able to make without any hesitation. And I can say that tonight without any hesitation. So thank you to you and thank you to the TDA. It makes us proud to be your partners. Thank you, Mary Easton. Thank you, Mary. And through you, Chair, uh, Stephanie was actually a finalist for one of the uh, Women in Business Awards uh, in oh, St. Catherine's yes. Standard as That's well. True. So uh, if she's being recognized even beyond our borders. Absolutely. Good point. Mr. Chairman, I have a statement. Again, I have a statement to uh, committee members from um, Councillor McPherson. <laughs> These are his words. Uh, the BIA, an organization formed by our small businesses in downtown Beamsville, has come a long way over the past few years. Successful marketing, beautification, and award-winning activities have helped transform our downtown. Along with support from community services, our downtown bench BIA has put a fresh face on downtown Beamsville through the outstanding leadership of Stephanie Hicks. The partnership between the town and our small businesses is an important economic tool as BIA's help drive downtown revitalization. We must recognize that the BIA levy is set by the downtown businesses through the Board of Directors. What we are saying with our financial contribution is that we recognize you have come together to make our downtown a destination we all take pride in. It is a small way of supporting our downtown businesses and he is stating, I am supportive of the financial contribution in our BIA and in Stephanie Hicks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. And, and since this was forwarded through the clerks, this is part of the official uh, minutes. Thank you. Okay. Councillor McCulloch. Thank you, Chair Pachareva. Through you to Stephanie and, and Mr. Darcy. I, I, uh, not many people out there support losers, and uh, it, you, you guys are proving yourselves to be winners. And uh, <laughs> the events that I've attended, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. The feedback I've received from the, 
the guests of those events has been positive, uh, echo, without echoing the same like everyone else. Uh, the, the challenge I would put before you is to perhaps change that uh, number, um, events revenue. Uh, if that, that, that would be a challenge I would present to the two of you if, if you could somehow, uh, I know you're working on an effort to change the grants uh, number, which is vacant as well, but uh, if, if you could, uh, that's a challenge that I would put before yourself. You're, you're accomplishing every other goal that you've set, uh, and, and, uh, and li uh, like I said, it's very tough supporting a loser, and, and you're proving yourselves to be winners and gaining confidence amongst this table. So. Thank you. Through you, Chair, I just want to, I was going to try and fit that in my presentation to answer your question, but in the essence of time, I was hoping that you would come back around and ask that question. So in our budget, we do show a zero there. Uh, a few things. We are audited by the town's auditors. So this year, did we have successful event revenues? Yes. Did we put them right back into events that we had? Yes. In our audit, you may show we may show at the end of the day um, possibly a carryover of maybe $1,000, which is great. Um, our, this is kind of our first year, not as a BIA, but as a BIA with a budget. Our 2019 budget, which was the first time we had a budget that was not maxed at $8,000 since 1978, uh, was approved in May. It was May 6th by, so we've had six months. Um, we've, you know, had $15,000 in grants, and we have had event revenue. It's hard for a board to put what one could coin as pie in the sky because really it doesn't exist for 2020 yet until we go after it. We also don't host a flagship event aside from the farmer's market. Um, and again, this year we put we made an effort to put any revenues right back in with our themes, with our bouncers to try and um, move the Beamsville farmer's market forward. In the future, I, I mean, the board has certainly spoke about having a flagship event. And from there, there are opportunities to have revenues when you bring in food trucks, you can take a commission, you can sell tickets and take however much commission off their meals or alcohol sales. I do believe that that can come in the future as well as big sponsorships for some of our items. But right now, we were working off a budget that was approved <laughs> in May. And uh, for 2020, we have some big ticket beautification items and really focusing on our expanded membership as well. So it, it will come. I don't know to what point that we can guarantee it and feel confident enough to put those numbers in our budget that we will 100%. They could be projected in our budget, for sure, and in the future if that's what council would like to see, but they're not guaranteed right now. Thank you for that explanation. And, and, and the, the one thing I fear is that without that hoped-for effort to generate revenue, there's just going to be a continued assumption of reception of funds. And I, I want to make sure that uh, that's not the case and that I look at events like the Fling on King and the revenue generated there from vendors. I kind of think that could change perhaps next year, you know, s certain tweaks, but I leave that up to you to, to make those decisions. Thank you. Council Brene. Thank you, Chair Patriva. So I could echo and echo everyone's comments. You guys are doing great work. We're so proud of you. We're so proud of what's happening in the downtown and, and the resurrection and the revitalization. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess I look at things slightly different in the fact that I've lived in this town my whole life. I can recall when the downtown Beamsville was very, very vi vibrant. We had a bowling alley. We had a movie theater. Uh, we had, you know, a Santa Claus parade. And I, I guess I'm echoing everything we're, we're, we're saying. I, I am so proud to, to say to the people that I hang around with that we're now having an event like Lincoln Rerouted so they don't have to get the razz all the time about people having to go to Port Colborne and Pelham. So we're doing wonderful things. But I also, I'm a realist, and I believe that this is a very, very, very fragile situation. I look at, you know, just recently, you know, pizza... Pizza Pizza closing up, Pita Pit closing up, the vape store closing up. And, you know, we did the walk-around businesses this, this past summer, and, um, 
and Stephanie, you were with us on, on some of them, and we heard, and you, 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 you shared it in your slides. You, d you didn't get to expand on it, but you, you talked about the parking issues and, and the things that we hear from the business owners and the truck traffic and that truck that's at the, at the intersection. Um, so again, you're, you guys are doing wonderful things. We're so proud of where we've come from, but I also, you know, I, I'm just, I just want to make sure that we continue to push in all the right areas. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity as we look forward, um, you know, to the opportunities with the BDSS pro property and what that can do for us in terms of helping us with our parking and, and making it a, a, a complete downtown area. So uh, again, whatever we can do to, to assist you guys with the parking, the bylaw, the trucking, you know, we need to continue to work with you guys to help you to get to where we need to get to go. But, you know, you guys are doing so many great things, um, but I just, I really believe it, it's almost like a teeter-totter where this thing, you know, it, it can go back and forth, right? And, you know, there's, you know, we still have some areas in the downtown core that we need to infill. And uh, again, I don't want this to be a negative. I, I'm hats off to everything that we're doing and the money we're investing. Um, but we need to continue to push. We need, we, need, we need to make it better. And I think we can do that. So thank you very much for all your hard work. No, I couldn't agree more. I think we're realists. Uh, we're, we're just, as she said, this is six months into our first real budget, quote unquote. So we're in our infancy in sort of what we're doing. Next year, we've got some plans already. I don't know if we can delineate all of them. Santa Claus Parade may be one of those things as well. And, a signature event, but I can't agree with you more. You can't rest on your laurels. We've done great, but you know it doesn't do anybody any good if we rest on that and we don't progress. So we understand that. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Thank, Thank you, problem. Stephanie. Yeah. And and I, I see no further questions. I just wanted to provide a couple comments myself. Thank you, Dr. Ray, again for for being voluntold a few years ago and coming on board. And and you know we had this discussion. You know, this this morning when I was in for a session, and I'm I'm here. He didn't break my neck because you know, and it was Councillor Mickluck's question. I said point blank, you know, having been council rep on the BIA for ten years, operating with a budget of eight thousand dollars, we hustled to generate income. We begged, borrowed, stealed, sold whatever we could to generate income, and and I appreciate you trying to do that and and I would look forward to and you know and and we were around the table where we said okay I'm going to have a two year contribution of $30,000 and when that BIA catchment area comes on board that's going to go away but Rome wasn't built in a day so I get that so what I would do and I know you've got um, Mr. Lupino around the table and we heard it tonight in the in the um, the tourism strategy events, Strawberry Festival. If you guys are contributing a lot of the heavy lifting to Fling on King, wrestle that away from the town, brand it your own. There's a revenue stream. Town will do the in-kind, I don't mean to speak out of, out of tune, but you know what, Did, grab that in-kind stuff from them. And if you're doing it, run with it. Put your stamp on it, be proud. And then, you know, then the 30 becomes a 20, and the 20 becomes a 10 and you're self-sustaining. But you've got revenue streams. You've got events. And, and like Councilor Brené said, you know, we don't have to go to Canal Days. We don't have to go to, to you know, the Spring Fest in Pelham. It's pretty damn cool to be on King Street and see what's happening. So thank you very much. Thank you. OK, last. But certainly not least is our delegation from the Lincoln Public Library Board to speak regarding their 2020 budget. So we've got uh, Julie Andrews, the CEO, and our chair, Donna Burton. Welcome, ladies. Thanks very much for having us. We're happy to be here. <clears throat> so we've got a five-minute one here for you. We've been, we've been paring it down as we were waiting a little bit, so we've got, we had some time. Um, <laughs> no offense intended. Um, so as we were busily planning for 2020 through you, Master Chair, 
Um, we thought we'd look back just quite briefly at all of the wonderful things we've already done this year. Okay. Uh, so the title says it all. The best summer ever. Uh, this summer we had our highest number of registrants, um, 404, and the highest number of books read at 3,525, which is one of the most important outcomes of that summer reading club is that it helps our kids avoid summer slide. So for those of you who don't know, it's, it's when a kid slides backwards from all the learning that they've done over the course of the year. Um, a recent study showed that in grades three to five, students lose 20% of what they learned in reading and math over the course of a year. Uh, so we're happy to offer our club free of charge. It both helps keep families and their children entertained and it hang helps them hang on to those hard learned skills that they learned all year. Uh, we also offer a range of pro literacy programs all year long, programs for babies, toddlers, family story time, songs and stories and rhymes. And we added some rigors to these programs this year so that we could measure the success. Um, we've, we've adopted the Every Child Ready to Read platform. A recent uh, survey that we provided to parents indicated over 95% of them said they learned something that they can share with their children and they feel more confident helping their kids learn. And we just think that's great. I mean, why not? Why not take that forward? We also introduced launch pads this year. Um, I think it's really interesting that we've said the word transformation tonight because you'll see in these slides there's just a little subliminal advertising about transformation that libraries help to provide. Uh, so we introduced these little numbers just after Labor Day and they've been a huge success. Uh, parents love that kids can play games um, while learning real reading and math and social studies, and kids love that they're using a tablet to play fun games. They don't even realize they're learning. Um, the parents also don't have the worry of young children, you know, being exposed to something on the internet because these are self-contained devices. They're ideal for preschool. We, we have programs for big kids too. Um, we have a something cool after school program and a something for teens and tweens and all the STEAM programs that we're doing helps the kids coming back. Uh, to help our members discover the joys of physical literacy, we partnered with the NPCA this year to offer a free family pass for Balls Falls and nature backpacks complete with high powered binoculars and guidebooks. So when we surveyed the community this summer, we wanted to know a lot of things, but one of the questions we asked them is what, what would you like to borrow from the library if we could borrow something different, something non-traditional, and passes to parks and museums was the top choice. So it bore out. Uh, we also added some terrific new indigenous resources this summer, uh, fiction and non-fiction for adults and children and we partnered with Ignite to make sure these items were labeled and displayed so as to make them prominent in our branches. This slide highlights some of our community partners. We're thrilled to be working with the town of Lincoln and Pathstone Mental Health to offer the Here and Now walk-in clinic every Thursday. Uh, it's really gaining some traction and we're very excited about that. Uh, we also have a Salvation Army partner. Uh, is, she's a fixture on Friday mornings. She's a mobile outreach worker and she has all the information that people need. Uh, we've found the response to these services has been really good. Uh, people feel at ease in a library environment and our kind and empathetic staff make it comfortable for them to get in, get the information they need in a, a calm and quiet way. Some of the special events we've taken part in since last summer are Culture Days, Ontario Public Library Week and our community survey as I mentioned. Uh, we love reaching out to the community and we went to events like Canada Day and the Sunset Music Series. And we especially like inviting folks to special events to talk about the library and, and complete our survey. So that was a quick wrap of what we've done in 2020 so far. Um, and this is Donna and she will go over our operating budget. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so yes, as CEO Julie said, uh, I get to <laughs> to do the budget part. This is our overall uh, budget uh, spreadsheet here. Uh, 
we are asking for an increase of 69,221 in total. Uh, so first I'd like to, well, I'd like to highlight a few uh, parts of our budget and starting with the revenue. With a higher percentage of materials borrowed being ebooks and streaming, overdue fines will continue to decrease. Uh, we have made changes to our meeting room rental policy and to our program uh, fees and these should result in higher revenues in these areas. Moving on to uh, grants and uh, donations. Uh, the provincial operating grant has remained at the same value for over 20 years. And that is actually based on the population of Lincoln in 1996. So that's <laughs> a little out of date, but that's what we get. We expect a small grant from Service Ontario, as well as from the Connectivity and Summer Program grants has been the case for the past several years. The library is also very grateful for the support of the mayor and her annual golf tournament, uh, as well as the Fleming Foundation for their annual grants. Those are very important to us and, and we are very thankful to receive them. Uh, we will continue to seek donations as our charitable status uh, does make us an attractive recipient. In addition, uh, we hope to form a Friends of the Library group uh, that will assist us with uh, seeking out donations and also more fundraising. So moving on to transfers. Lastly, on the revenue side, we will transfer 16,106 to IT capital reserves for the ongoing maintenance and replacement of equipment. We have transferred $5,000 from operating to capital for our planned makerspace project. This was a donation from St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church when it closed down a few years ago. So we've been um, kind of saving it for something special uh, to use that. We were uh, uh, very pleased to receive that. Uh, and lastly, we will transfer 34,000 from uh, DC Reserve to assist with collection purchases. Now, moving on to uh, expenses. First off, salaries, wages, and benefits. We would like to make our programming and outreach assistant a full-time position from its current 25 hours a week. In addition, we would like to have an additional four hours per week for our circulation team to provide more of their excellent customer service. But the biggest uh, uh, impact in this particular area of expenses is the increase in salaries and benefits that pertain to grid level increases that are out of our control. When our CEO salary was reviewed, the role received an increase to bring compensation in line with other Town of Lincoln directors. The deputy CEO was also similarly reviewed and increased. Uh, just before we leave this slide, I'd also uh, like to point out the, the photo here. I don't know if any of you met this uh, young fellow, but uh, his name is David Junior Watsko. And he was a student that was working, uh, well, actually volunteering really, on a uh, program uh, this summer for about five weeks in the library. And this student is from Greece Fjord, Nunavut. And so I think he really did add a lot to, uh, to uh, the library and the staff and the programming. So. Okay, moving on to the next slide is administrative expenses. Uh, this is a slight increase here of uh, $1,944. And that comes largely from additional courier and postage expenses in the wake of provincial cuts to the Southern Ontario Library Service and to their courier and interlibrary loan budgets. And uh, as a result, the libraries had to absorb that, that both that cost and that time. The library is committed to professional development of its staff and, and conferences, workshops, and training webinars and sessions are carried out throughout the year. And there are also hundreds of programs that are delivered over the course of the year. And the supplies of these are included in these budget lines. Finally, or, or at least the next one is operational services and supplies. This one's actually down 6,800. 
Uh, well, our collections budget has risen slightly to include a DVD Express collection and increased e-magazine and e-book titles. We've been able to budget less for consultants' fees as our recruitment and strategic planning will be completed this year. And that gives an overview of our budget. And thank you very much for listening. We'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Mayor Easton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to congratulate you on um, the um, very obvious um, enthusiasm that seems to be exuding from the muse from the uh, from the library, and uh, and the um, the variety of programs that you continue to offer. It's it's really uh, very encouraging at a time when a lot of people are questioning the relevance of libraries. I think in Lincoln that we, we certainly take the work that you do very seriously. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I'd like to know a little bit more about the outreach assistant. What does that position do? Mr. Chair, uh, she goes out into the community. So she's one of the people who partners with the various organizations. Um, getting our speaker series going, going out into schools. So we do a lot of work with the schools, a lot of class visits, so we go out and they come in, and she's part of doing that. She's also our marketer, so um, she's responsible for a lot of, she wears a lot of hats. Mr. Chairman, I'm curious um, whether that position has anything to do with supporting homeschooling. Uh, well, we all do. <laughs> we all do support homeschooling, but mostly that is um, our frontline staff, which we all are t as well. So all of our staff provide um, frontline service. So she does that as well. Okay. And does that include going into uh, individual homes? No. Okay. Not at this you. time. Um, also, um, I'm very pleased, Mr. Chairman, that you didn't throw up your hands um, when it came to providing the courier services because they are so important. However, when you got to the last slide in regard to the um, money that you've identified as surplus, um, I'm wondering, Mr. Chairman, if, if um, the um, if it's surplus, what was it, 30, 31,000 that you said was related to the use, uh, uh, that you spent that money previously on the consultant um, for the executive director's position. Um, is there any reason why that money couldn't be redirected in 2020 to help offset the courier services? Certainly it has been just in a different way, just within the budget. We've absorbed that in one way and then we've, we've actually lowered the cost of some things in our right. budget and then and move some in from DCs okay, to cover other right. things. I misunderstood how yeah. you were applying that. Okay, that's great. I, s I was curious about why you would be uh, giving, giving up that much money. No, no it was, it was it's 6,800. Just, Just yeah. yeah. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Councillor McCulloch. Thank you, Chair Patrick. Through you to the presenters. Um, good job. Uh, I like I like the um, I like the way you presented your budget figures and your explanation of the lines. I, I thought that was very thorough. Uh, question I have is with regards to salaries, wages, and benefits. It seems like a larger number than you know year over year. A concern I have is next year when you come to budget, it's going to be that much plus cost of living on top by hiring these new hires. Question I have is, have you explored any possible partnerships with universities or colleges to source um, uh, students that may be willing to do what you're hoping to do at a possibly reduced rate of pay? to gain experience in a field of study? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, absolutely we do that. Uh, we, had, we hosted two students last summer and we plan to have more this summer. And I'm looking at uh, an internship as well. Um, this, what you saw in this budget this year is a correction. So it's not something that's going to continue to be such a, a large increase, but it will be more along the lines of the grid increases 
as we go, so it's this is a correction. Oh. Hence the amount. Okay, so three, so a majority of that number is a correction. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so moving along, consent agenda, we have none. Regular agenda, we are now considering item 7.1, the 2020 operating budget review. So our CAO, Mr. Kirkopoulos, will be providing a presentation and hopefully he can be as succinct as our library presentation was. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no pressure, wow. though. I will, I will do my best uh, and try to get to the questions. Uh, so the agenda this evening, we are gonna kick off our operating budget. Uh, in terms of uh, a little bit of an overview and a recap, this is the second time we're in front of a uh, committee on operating, going to our proposed departmental operating budgets, a bit of a budget breakdown and next steps. So, uh, so this slide you saw in the last presentation, this speaks to what is uh, in the operating budgets, uh, the major driver being salaries and wages, uh, and then of course the level of service with respect to programs and services. Our operating budget uh, includes uh, the following key items, base adjustments, one-time expenditures, uh, costs and revenues uh, from previous year service levels as they relate to growth, uh, and of course the operating impacts uh, that we experience from capital projects. So Lincoln's budget process, uh, you've heard me say this on a number of occasions, it is a year-round effort. Uh, budget monitoring takes place through the year. There are financial statements uh, they get reported on a regular basis to committee and council. Uh, similarly with budget variance reporting uh, and capital budget amendments as required. We are in front of council almost on a regular basis talking budget at various points uh, in the budget process. Uh, the 2019 budget schedule uh, is often set in the summer and we work towards that. Uh, the senior management team budget planning meetings and review again start happening at that particular point in time. Uh, and I can uh, assure members of council uh, that uh, I, along with the department heads, review uh, on a line-by-line -line basis uh, the budgets and what you see in front of you. Uh, and there's some 3,000 different line items uh, when you look at the entire organization uh, that we go through. We are always uh, looking at work planning uh, and budgets uh, and anticipating the year ahead. So this slide uh, is a repeat slide from the last uh, presentation, a little bit uh, focused on those uncontrollable and controllable uh, elements uh, in the uncontrollable side. We've heard a lot this evening around salaries, wages, and benefit. Uh, we often talk about cost of living, uh, but I, I think sometimes the better way to frame cost of living is really that negotiated settlement that we have uh, through our collective agreements uh, and the policy that the town has of uh, the non-union uh, being uh, or mimicking uh, our unionized collective agreement obligations through CUPE. Uh, and so that is 1.5% this year, as it has been for the last number of years. Of course, we're often talking about progressing through the grid, and that is depending on the tenure of the employee. A lot of newer employees uh, start off at the base level uh, of the grid and progress upwards. And then similarly, there are uh, payroll and benefit changes, things that are uh, being passed down uh, from the provincial government and other levels of government, uh, and those are highlighted there. Uh, a little bit of information for you just on where inflation sits and the ranges of those uh, and all the other variables that affect uh, what we do on a regular basis. Of course, uh, on the other side of the ledger is those things that are more control, controllable or what we refer to as discretionary. And these are oftentimes uh, the frequency with which we provide services. So again, uh, some items that you've seen in the past before. A little bit of uh, budget commitments to date and, and where we sit, 1.5% uh, uh, is tentatively approved uh, for the capital uh, special infrastructure levy uh, for us to be putting in the bank and again preparing for the future. The capital budget levy impact uh, right now is sitting at 1.59%, that is approximately 0.5% for capital projects and uh, the other uh, little under a percent uh, for the long-term borrowing charges that make up uh, a total of approximately 3%. Uh, I think an important reminder uh, is, and we oftentimes talk percentages, but it's important to talk dollars. 
uh, percentage uh, of 1% uh, in Lincoln is $165,000. Uh, you go to our neighbors uh, to the east, that's closer to a million dollars uh, and so forth. So size does matter. Uh, the importance of uh, the municipalities uh, looking at what 1% is in our municipality versus somewhere else uh, is important. So below, again, shows you a little bit of that recap in terms of what a percent is in various places. And so in Hamilton, 1% is almost $7 million. At Niagara Region, that's close to $4 million. Uh, and here in Lincoln, that's 165000 So moving forward to department budgets, you will see in each of the budget outlines, uh, similar to what you saw with the library uh, coming before us, a line that speaks to revenue. Of course, we speak to expenses the various transfers, if applicable, and those interfunctional charges, were, uh, which are important as it relates specifically to how we charge back certain projects on the capital side. You will see some 2020 proposed budget included in the presentation, the change from 2019 summarized in the chart, and I will highlight, uh, as will the senior management team uh, when they answer questions, uh, the drivers uh, and what uh, those drivers uh, are, are leading to in terms of impact. Uh, we are talking a little bit about transfers and an overview on the next slide. Um, and just an overall breakdown of salaries and wages is provided. As I said, what's driving our salaries and wages line uh, to the tune of about 49, 48% of the impact on the operating uh, is uh, a living wage uh, change added this year. And that's something uh, Chair Patrick Riva, I mean, you've asked us to come forward with, members of council have asked us to come forward with. Uh, and so we've implemented that, and I can speak more to that. Of course, the appropriate call-in pay for our firefighters. We were at uh, one hour. Uh, there was a, a thought to move to three hours. We did settle on two hours, and that is an appropriate level. Uh, and Chief Hudson can speak to that should you have any questions. And uh, as you heard in the previous uh, General Business and Finance Committee, uh, the new business function to support tourism uh, as a key economic driver. So here's a little bit of a summary. We do provide this uh, every year uh, in terms of uh, impacts. Uh, you see a total levy impact uh, netted out of 796,000 for salaries and benefits. Uh, and the way we come up with that uh, is the salary and benefit line and then the offsets. Some of our staff are funded through water and wastewater rates uh, as is appropriate. Uh, and so we have a $796,000 impact as it relates to salaries and benefits. Uh, and then uh, there's a little bit of a breakdown there that looks at what the various elements of that 796 are. So as I highlighted earlier, approximately 50,000 uh, for a living wage, and that takes into account our crossing guards, our museum interpreter staff, and our CSRs, our volunteer firefighter call-in, uh, and that is about 260,000, our new FDE request at 65,000, uh, and uh, those uh, non-union and union grid progressions, the collective agreement obligations, uh, and our on-call pay adjustments at 425000 Every year we get asked about transfers and those transfer breakdowns uh, and how they're captured. And so below is uh, what trans gets transferred into uh, our various reserves. Uh, and you see that broken down uh, to the approximate amount of $325,000. So community services and some of the budget drivers. So going through each of the departments, you will see a, a list of budget drivers, and then you will see the departmental budget. Uh, again, we can speak in more details. I have tried to summarize these budget drivers. Uh, you will see some similarities in some departments and things that are different in other departments. Um, when we look at financial revenues, uh, there is a little bit of a reduction in the trust income for cemeteries to reflect actuals. And every year we are looking at the various actuals versus uh, what we've budgeted and uh, becoming uh, ever more precise uh, in the way we do our business. The salaries and wages line, uh, two of our uh, categories are captured within community services. Uh, and so those obligations are there. Uh, the 1.5%, as I've highlighted, which it will be consistent through each of the departments, as well the grid progression. Uh, and we're constantly reviewing our hours uh, and appropriate budgeting to support programs. Uh, at the end of the day, we are trying to be very incremental. Uh, we are trying to look at part-time hours, part-time employees, uh, where we can increase hours by one or two here and there. Uh, each of those line items, uh, I, I made a comment earlier uh, to Mary Eason, if we were to increase each of our line items, all 3,000, uh, you know, by a few dollars, you can see how that starts to add up. Uh, 
you know, even if we were to increase each line by $100. Uh, and so uh, we do make incremental changes, incremental improvements. Uh, and then on the utility side, we continue to look at actuals. Uh, we continue to cr try to incorporate uh, rebates from the province. And so again, every year, uh, they're bigger drivers some years, they're less drivers in other years. Here is your community services uh, breakdown uh, in terms of uh, where we are sitting. Community services and public works are two larger departments, uh, two larger drivers. Uh, you see on the revenue side, uh, we've highlighted uh, our proposed budget uh, and some of the changes. Uh, so an increase, uh, or sorry, a decrease in, uh, in financial revenue from a to in the total line there, uh, of 5,883. And then we've highlighted the various expense categories, uh, the major driver being uh, salaries and wages, as I highlighted earlier. Uh, expense totals, total 240,000 and, and a bit, uh, with a 2020 net levy request of $291,000. Public works, and this does include water and wastewater. Uh, user fees and grants uh, is a driver uh, within the public works department. Uh, we have a reduction due to uh, the completion of some of the grant funding in 2019. Uh, there is some phasing of construction uh, for various permits and service charges. Uh, and so some of those service charges that we benefit from when we charge them, we're going to see a little bit of a decrease. Uh, so on the revenue side and the user fee side, uh, we're seeing a decrease uh, in service charges. Uh, utilities, uh, a little bit of a good news story here. Our transfer at LED lights uh, and those provincial rebates, again, uh, are allowing us to see uh, a, a small decrease in our utility costs. Uh, of course, our operational service uh, and supplies. Uh, Council will know uh, the way we calculate uh, how much sand we're buying or how much salt we're buying is based on a three-year average. Uh, if we've had uh, a year where we've had considerable snowfall, considerable storm, uh, considerable inclement weather, uh, that does play with our average. Uh, it is a way for us to uh, err on the side of uh, safety. It is, some people use a five-year average. We are using a three-year average. Uh, and so if you look back to the last number of years, uh, within that three-year average, uh, we are seeing some increased snow. We're seeing increased weather uh, issues. Uh, Lincoln does provide a high level of service as it relates to its snow clearing, uh, something that council has set as a level of service. Uh, of course, salaries, wages, and benefits, as I said, uh, you'll hear this as a consistent theme, uh, Public Works being our largest department. Um, so some implications as it relates to that particular area. Uh, and of course, there's some mandatory training and professional development fees uh, that have to happen with some of our water staff, the training of those staff, uh, and some of our other roads uh, staff as well. Uh, you'll see a very small increase. Uh, Dave reminds me. Uh, with, with his budget, uh, we are seeing a 0.99% increase uh, in public works. Uh, it is a very much a status uh, quo budget looking at uh, where we're at. Uh, the largest driver uh, is uh, salaries, wages, and benefits, as you see there. Uh, and so uh, overall, we're seeing a net levy uh, impact of $40,540. Here's the wa water and wastewater uh, item. Uh, and similarly, you see the revenues laid out there, uh, our expenses, uh, and uh, a 2020 net levy that shows zero because that is a rate-supported and rate-funded budget. Lincoln Fire Rescue. Uh, again, uh, some trends we're seeing with uh, adjustments based on actuals. Uh, from a user fee and charges perspective. Again, some of this is uh, science, some of it is art, some of it is just naturally what happens in terms of the types of responses we get, the number of accidents and, and so forth. Uh, the major driver, as I highlighted earlier in the presentation, really is the full year costs associated with the two hour phase in. Uh, and that is important from the perspective of a continued support for our volunteer model. Uh, some comments there, just highlighting the important role uh, that that volunteer service pays, the cost of that volunteer service. Uh, and there are a number of municipalities, uh, and uh, there was a question, I think, earlier on in our capital program that, that looked at uh, what other municipalities are paying from the perspective of fire service. You have municipalities like Thorold that are significantly smaller, Port Colburn, et cetera, that have uh, a full-time complement uh, or a composite complement uh, that are paying three, four, or five times uh, what we are paying. So there is huge value in 
uh, our fire rescue service and the way it's modeled. And so the two hour phase in was supported last year and we do have a full year uh, implementation of that. Of course, some continued expansion of and growth in the fire code reinspection process and inspection program, uh, the essential for new facilities, homes, occupancies to come on board. This chart shows uh, similarly uh, where we're sitting at from a revenue perspective uh, and a expense perspective. Uh, the major driver being the $300,000 for salaries, wages, and benefits uh, as it relates specifically uh, to the two hour phase in for a total 2020 net levy of $328,145. Uh, planning and development and some budget drivers. Uh, there is a, uh, there, there was a handout uh, that was provided by Ms. Dale. Uh, if council doesn't have it, we'll make sure you do have it, but I think it should be in your packages that just lays out, I think what we were trying to talk about in that last presentation, and that is just the phases of development, the phases of construction and how money finds its way uh, in and out at various times of the year and at various years in that development cycle. Uh, and so that's, that, that's definitely a driver as it relates to planning. Uh, so there is, a, again, a decrease in 2020 uh, in some of those service charges that we benefit from in other years. Um, and of course, uh, salaries, wages, and benefits. Uh, we see living wage for crossing guards as part of that uh, in terms of an impact. Uh, progression through our salary grids uh, and the collective agreement obligations uh, and uh, licensing and mandatory training uh, that is also prevalent within uh, our planning department. So the increases you see here, uh, some of them uh, on the revenue side uh, equates for a little under uh, $75,000. Uh, so we're seeing a decrease in some of our revenues as a result of that construction phasing. Uh, salaries, wages, and benefits, uh, we are seeing uh, an increase of $154,000 uh, and uh, operational uh, services and supplies uh, going up a bit as well as some of those uh, basic uh, administrative costs. Finance and admin, uh, budget drivers. Uh, again, uh, a little bit of a trend here in terms of either what we're getting uh, coming from other levels of government or the success that we've had similar to what uh, Julie said as it relates to the library. Uh, when, when you change the way you do your work a bit uh, and you move to more of an electronic means, you get less, uh, less penalties, uh, no different than us. Uh, as we're starting to be more successful in recouping some of those tax arrears, uh, less and less interest is achieved there. More and more people are remain compliant because we're finding solutions for them. So there's obs absolutely uh, and obviously a, a, an impact to budget. Uh, there are some minor adjustments uh, on the wages side as well. Uh, small uh, reduction due to the tile drainage loan offset by revenue. Uh, and again, uh, maintaining current service levels while implementing some of our uh, town-wide technology improvements. Uh, and so uh, we are seeing some of those impacts as well. Uh, here's the budget as it relates to finance and admin. Uh, and again, a uh, little bit of a decrease on the revenue side, uh, expenses uh, coming in uh, at around 55,000 for salaries, wages, and benefits. Uh, and as you can see, a total net levy of about $95,000. Uh, some of the, uh, some of the drivers as it relates to finance and admin, as I highlighted earlier, uh, and council has seen the chart, uh, there is a significant reduction year over year that we're seeing uh, from our OMPF funding. Uh, that was close to a million dollars a decade ago, uh, and it is uh, you know, proceeding uh, and, and approaching about $200,000 now. Uh, and so each year uh, we're seeing a decrease. So 89,000 from last year. Uh, eventually there will be a leveling off. Uh, there is a formula that the uh, province uses. Uh, and so uh, th that's definitely an impact this year for us. Uh, when you look at again, 164,000 being 1%, uh, and this decrease of 89,000, uh, that is more than half a percent. And of course, uh, a reduction due to in-year supplemental taxes and pay in lieu. Uh, so some small things that you're seeing there. Here's the slide that really lays out uh, what that looks like uh, and, and the major driver being that 89,000 that we spoke about. So clerks and legislative services. Uh, similarly, we're seeing some grid progression and collective uh, agreement obligations. Uh, there are some temporary funding resources uh, that we have right now doing uh, records management that will continue uh, 
uh, into next year uh, in, in terms of finishing off that work. Some of that is being funded through our uh, modernization dollars because it did qualify for that. Uh, there is some fire and finance reconciliation with MTO that is currently happening. Each of, our, uh, each of the three departments that touch uh, that particular service, that particular uh, element, uh, so fire, uh, clerks and legislative services, and finance all had you know, some small dollars associated to that. We put them all together uh, in one budget uh, so that we can continue to work with MTO and recoup those costs and see those revenues come in. Uh, and of course, there's just the general business processes uh, with respect to uh, some of our technology that continue to take place. Uh, and so, uh, as I said there, there's a consolidation of some of those costs into one line. So uh, you're seeing an increase here really on the salaries and wages side. Uh, and an overall net levy impact of $93,000. Uh, the CAO's office, uh, budget drivers and areas of focus, uh, and so when we speak about the CAO's office, that is human resources, communications, economic development, uh, tourism, as we've been talking about this evening, uh, and then some other functions that don't necessarily have uh, resources or are shared resources around corporate strategy, special projects, some of the government relations work. Um, there has been an adjustment, you'll see, uh, in the CAO's office budget uh, where all the ABCs are, are funded through uh, that particular uh, uh, line item uh, to support tourism, uh, and that uh, is occurring within economic development. Uh, there is some customer service dollars that were put away uh, with the goal of supplementing, as we said at the previous meeting, the provincial funding via the modernization grant, so $15,000 uh, as it relates to that. Uh, we continue to make incremental, uh, not necessarily as much as we'd like to, investment in our CIPs. So an additional $20,000 this year to be put away uh, to grant those monies out. Uh, if we don't grant them out, it stays in the bank uh, and it gets carried over. But an important, uh, you know, an important effort as we look at uh, investing in small, uh, small grants, investing in uh, our local businesses and so forth. Uh, of course, uh, the major driver in the CAO's office budget uh, is the new FTE for economic development and tourism. Uh, a business case has been provided to council. Uh, you heard Mr. Deany reference it a little bit earlier in the previous presentation. Uh, and then just uh, some minor uh, increases in the web HR software enhancements uh, so that we uh, continue to move to more online migration. So a little bit of the business case uh, here, uh, further to what you've received, that focuses on that tourism economic development position that is a net new FTE. Uh, it is a new function uh, that, that we uh, haven't done before. Uh, and uh, I've always said those types of uh, roles and responsibilities uh, are important for me to bring to council uh, to make sure I get council buy-in on those and that we have council buy-in. So uh, the rationale, again, a lot of that was in the previous presentation, uh, tourism being an economic driver, uh, our tourism strategy, the need for that uh, public-private partnership that we spoke about. Uh, a little bit of highlighting uh, what the role will do, um, support council priorities, manage destination uh, attraction, uh, investment in the rural and downtown areas, uh, and developing and really executing our tourism program. So when you look at um, CAO's office and those impacts, uh, salaries, wages, and benefits being the major driver, uh, as well as some operational services and supplies, that is really some of those consulting dollars uh, that we have uh, within the CAO's office uh, to do some of the work. We have a lot of things forthcoming in 2020 uh, that Council's aware of, uh, whether that be the BDSS precinct that was mentioned earlier. Uh, we have work uh, that we're going to be undertaking as it relates specifically to West Lincoln Memorial Hospital and a number of other key initiatives. Uh, and so those consulting dollars are, are put there for that matter. Uh, overall, uh, you see an impact of 154,000. As I said, the major driver being uh, a new FTE. Uh, so budget drivers for council, uh, uh, council has a, a very lean budget uh, as it relates to uh, uh, operational supply. So we continue to incrementally add some dollars for operations, uh, specifically to right sizing the budget for council, uh, citizen engagement activity, promotion, materials and supplies. Uh, councillors are having many more uh, public meetings. You're having more ward meetings. We continue to support you in those. Uh, the delegation meetings to AMO, uh, so again, very small incremental increases for various outreach and service needs, consulting uh, dollars. Uh, 
priority implementation, those sorts of things that we do uh, kind of on a yearly basis. You'll see the increase there, really a very small increase uh, for council. Again, uh, some small amounts as it relates to the collective agreement obligations and those 1.5, uh, et cetera, uh, and really uh, a little bit uh, of money to right size those uh, outreach budgets uh, that council has. Nearing the end, Mr. Chair. Uh, overall, uh, here is the uh, impact that we're looking at. Uh, you know, I remind council uh, we are focused on operating this evening. Uh, this year, you will have approximately uh, a $50 million uh, budget, uh, probably a little bit more actually, closer to $60 million, uh, and you're seeing a little bit uh, over uh, a million and a half in an increase uh, in terms of uh, the 2020 budget and, and that change. Uh, important, as we spoke last time at the last committee and council asked questions on, you know, what are other things that affect your tax bill? Uh, it isn't uh, just the municipalities piece or the regions piece. There's, of course, uh, every four years we have that MPAC element uh, in terms of the province and MPAC uh, as that organization that assesses uh, the value of one's home. That happens and then there is a implementation uh, that is phased in over four years. So you're almost always seeing an increase in, your, in the value of your home. Uh, and those reassessment shifts uh, and the burden of those shifts. So as a summary, uh, here are a list of the overall drivers. Again, things that we've shared with council. Next steps, uh, we're here to answer uh, your questions this evening. Uh, council inquiries, uh, what you want us to come back with, uh, what those scenarios look like. Uh, and so Mr. Chair, I will uh, turn it back to you and uh, staff and, and I are here to answer any questions council may have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kirkopoulos. Any questions from council? Councillor McCulloch, would you start us off, please? Well. Kind of, what kind of budget meeting would it be if I uh, didn't ask a question <laughs> of our CEO? Uh, thank you, Chair Pachariva. Um, so looking at this budget, which, yep, it's a big one. Any, uh, where if we could try to shave this budget? Where, you know, where, where, is there an opportunity? What should we consider uh, trimming this budget or you know, what areas could we look at to find savings or to find efficiencies or to, again, it just looks like an automatic, you know, 5%, 5, you know, without, I don't know what sort of thought there is. Uh, it's just, even even with the council budget, it's up 30, 32 grand, and I'm not sure really what we're going to do different from this year to last year. And uh, if you can explain some some of that for me. Uh, three, Mr. Chair. So let me take a stab at, at, at the uh, at, at uh, Councillor Mikulik's uh, question. I, I mean, I, I bring up this slide because I think uh, you know it lays out the areas in which uh, you know we can potentially look at making some service uh, reductions. Uh, and I think uh, it's not always service reductions we like to look at, but uh, it, and I think you'd hear this uh, from most. Um, you know, a smaller organization, we have to function uh, very lean already. Uh, it's not like uh, we have uh, a number of staff uh, that do singular tasks. We have a number of staff that do a multitude of tasks that wear multiple hats uh, and that are out there doing uh, a number of, uh, our directors are not only directing, they're supervising, they're managers, um, and similarly, uh, it goes down uh, the, the levels uh, within the organization. Of course, we can look at the level of service we're providing, so that's one element every year. Uh, I think when council uh, tasked me with going back and looking at where can we find savings, that's definitely one way to do it. The frequency with which we do certain things and certain activities absolutely costs money. Uh, and so there are some standards. Uh, there's minimum maintenance standards and then there's what is above minimum maintenance standards. Uh, so that's definitely one area. There are discretionary programs uh, and services that we do. We put on festivals, we put on uh, programming. Uh, there's definitely, you know, council can look at those sorts of things. Um, legal advice is one of those areas that uh, we are seeing increases in. Uh, that is the nature of uh, what we're dealing with. Issues are more complex. 
Uh, we want we sometimes want legal uh, opportunities to look at things. We are looking at uh, a legal RFP uh, and looking at uh, partnering with other municipalities to see if we can get some better value on that. We don't know the results of that, but we'll be coming forward in the new year as it relates to that. Um, you know, some small increases on the professional development, and we spoke about that. Uh, some of it's mandated in terms of uh, the licenses that our staff carries. Um, you know, of course, uh, again, you know, we plant flowers. Uh, you know, one of the things I heard four years ago was the importance of beautification. We didn't have a beautification program. We've invested in it. So can we look at cutting back on that? Uh, absolutely. Our ABCs, uh, you've had three ABCs here this evening talking about some slight increases. Uh, the library, the BIA, the TVTA. We have other agreements with service clubs. Uh, I'm not saying that those are the only things we can do. Of course, we've got an FTE ask for tourism and economic development. Uh, that is a driver as well within the budget. Um, and so, you know, when I look at what's controllable, it really is those discretionary things. Some of those programs that we offer uh, that I think are nice to haves, uh, that are important, they may be traditional. Um, and again, some of those fall uh, within uh, the realm of uh, can we cut them? Absolutely. Uh, can we cut, cut back on the type of programming we offer in our uh, arenas and, and community centers, some of our summer programming? done a great job of building that up but you know I understand your your comments counselor and the importance of uh, you know shaving budgets should we need to save them so those would be the areas that you know if you were to send me back I'd look in those particular areas and uh, you know come back to council with scenarios not things that I'd recommend and that's why I think you've got the budget you do in front of you because I think they add value uh, and uh, and they build uh, community and so that's why they're here uh, I never bring anything that I don't fully support but I understand the tough position council is in with needing to find savings and needing to maintain affordability. Just uh, thank you for that response. And just the reason why I ask that is when I look at um, uh, finance and I look at um, public works and their budgets came in relatively close to or acceptable to what they were in the past, it, I, I just wonder if it's not possible that we can try you know, I mean, these, these areas, I'm sure, are growing along with the town that uh, they're not making efforts to save when, you know, when others may not. And that's, 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 that's just what I want to ensure. And then the um, question I have is uh, with regards to the fire um, salaries, that, uh, that increase in w salaries, that's... That's strictly for the call out, for the two hour call out. There's no request for a, another full time uh, firefighter or full time inspector or full time emergency coordinator. That's, there's no surprises there. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there are no surprises there. Uh, th that is the full year implementation of the two hour call out. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Councilor Brene. Thank you, Chair Patriba. Through you to Mr. Uh, Kirkopoulos. I'm wondering if you could uh, comment. Um, when I look at the, the revenue breakdown for the planning and development, I'm assuming that, that bylaw is falling into that category. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the Councillor, that is correct, Councillor. So, so when, when, I look, when I look at the changes that have taken place, in bylaw just in the last four years since since I've been on council last term and this term to me that that that's one of the biggest areas that I, that I see um, so is it is it safe to say through you mr. chair to the CEO that 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 154 is is fairly reflective of, of some bylaw increases I'm just I'm actually surprised it's it's maybe not even a little bit more so just interested in your comment on that uh, through you mr. chairman uh, some of those increases are bylaw related uh, planning is also a fairly large department in terms of the staff complement. So again, some of it is uh, the increases uh, specifically uh, as everyone goes through that 1.5%. But as you'll recall, we do have uh, we have uh, four bylaw officers functioning in a full-time slash part-time complement, uh, including the manager. Uh, and so this is this is looking at increasing their hours slightly. I don't have the exact amount, but it is looking at increasing some of those part-time hours from 24. Uh, moving up, just looking at the complexity of cannabis and some other things that, that Mr. Smith and, and Mr. Bruder, along with uh, Ms. Dale, are looking at in terms of 
uh, how to be responsive and continue to be responsive. So those are incorporated in there, Councillor. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Russell. Thank you, Master Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the new handle. <laughs> it's nice. Um, through you to the CAO, um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it is a large budget. Uh, I know we've, we've kind of been going through this for the last uh, few weeks now. Um, I, I'm looking at your uncontrollable and controllable costs. And again, I, I know a lot of the uncontrollable costs do account for that levy increase, but uh, the controllable side, I am happy to see uh, some of the uh, inclusions in there, including the two-hour call out to our, our firefighters. I learned uh, the value of their role in our community uh, in my single day as a uh, quote unquote uh, fireman um, and just talking and sharing some of the stories with them about uh, again what they do and what some of the uh, the environments that they're up against so again I'm, I'm glad to see that I'm also glad to see um, that living wage increase uh, for some of our uh, frontline staff that are uh, again out there day after day uh, in some of the harshest conditions um, and I think that support goes a long way so again seeing those in there and seeing that part of that increase uh, again I see uh, some value um, uh, but to Councillor Mikulik's uh, point, again, I, I would like to see um, staff do, an, again, a review and see where we can cinch up. Again, it behooves us to make sure that we are doing our due diligence to make sure that we are coming in a responsible number for our residents. So I, I take that away with no, uh, no number to, to hit, but again, see uh, what kind of magic can be done to uh, bring us down to a lower level. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and I, uh, you know, I mean, you know, of course, when we think about uh, this particular slide, uh, you know, the 1.5 is, is, is again, a driver. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Staff are fully supportive of it. Uh, but we will look at both, uh, you know, what, what was just mentioned uh, by uh, both Councillor Mikulik and uh, Councillor Russell, Vice Chair Russell, uh, specifically as it relates to, to looking at where in that controllable area, uh, you know, we can come back uh, and uh, potentially look to trim uh, this budget. Okay. Thank you, VC. Mayor Easton. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have a question about insurance um, through you to the CAO. <clears throat> and um, what are our costs? How much are they going up? And um, is there anything about that, the model that we're using right now, just in terms of um, the way we're operating that portfolio that uh, that could improve the situation. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, I, I will look to Terry to speak to that. I, I asked her that same question about insurance, and we've had a number of conversations on insurance and should we be going out and when should we be going out to look at. Similar like we're going to do with and, and have started to do with legal, uh, is there an opportunity to reap some benefits on the insurance side? So I know Terry has some comments on that. So th through the chair, uh, in the current budget, uh, we've estimated about a 10% increase for the from the 2019 budget. Our 2019 insurance came in higher than we had an anticipated to begin with. And then for 2020, uh, there are already <coughs> um, comments going around that the insurance industry is going to see a lot of hikes for 2020. Um, but we're still in the process of discussing it with our insurance company for 2020, but we're going to go out again in, within 2020 and do another RFP in order to get, to get it for 2021 to see what we can do with it. Okay. Um, is there anything about the way we have structured our deductibles that are creating increased operating costs, either for legal or for internal staff. So through the chair, we do have fairly uh, significant deductibles in my opinion. Um, I asked about, we had discussions before about lowering the amount that we cover uh, overall in my discussions with the insurance company, it's not gonna be a significant savings if we were to reduce that even by uh, $20 million. It's not an, a significant savings to our premium, but there's definitely uh, various options that we can discuss with our insurance company to try and make it come down a little bit as well. 
Yeah. So I, that's not, uh, okay. I, what I wanted to know is whether or not by having high deductibles that we were filling the gap either with legal, additional legal support or additional interventions um, and pressures on, um, on, on our staff. I don't know what our deductibles are. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, and, and we can definitely get that uh, back to Council so that Council is aware of it. Uh, but I think, you know, we're constantly looking at, uh, and I think going back out in 2020, uh, there's huge competition within the insurance industry. Uh, and so I think going out looking at what that competition potentially yields us is important. But of course, having legal at the table is going to be important as well. I know uh, the number of files that I receive on my desk uh, that involve the two, when, when, when there is potential litigation, the two are constantly working hand in hand. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, to Mary Easton's point, it, it's, it's essential that we look at is there a net benefit to those two working together, working more symbiotically. The 10% increase um, specifically for premiums as it relates to that budget line item, we can get Council the details uh, on that uh, uh, and definitely make sure uh, that, you know, when we look at that gap and when we look at deductibles, is, it, is the level of risk that we're assuming uh, helping us to the net positive or, or the net negative? And Mr. Chairman, a few weeks ago, um, and you made reference to this, and, and uh, it relates to the insurance policy that the town held for a number of years with the last administration involved. And it seemed to me that when we changed carriers after that period of time, that there was discussion. I remember being in the chambers at that time and listening to the discussion um, about um, the carryover of responsibilities that we would have, even though we no longer were insured with that company. Mr. Chairman, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> and, um, and I have spoken to other municipalities that also had that same carrier, and uh, they have um, been involved in uh, insurance claims uh, several years after the fact. Have we had any of those claims? I've never heard anything about that and would we be anticipating that? How are we tracking that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think specific to that particular instance, I, I did hear a lot of those when I started almost four years ago uh, when I you know, came, came to Council and, and we shared and spoke a little bit about uh, insurance, insurance premiums, uh, the previous insurance carrier. Uh, that holdover really comes from ongoing litigation uh, and ongoing files that remain open. Uh, and so I think similarly, if we were to go with a new carrier, we would make sure we wrap up those particular cases that remain outstanding uh, and ensure that we're going into a new carrier, um, you know, with, with a clean uh, slate, so to speak. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, there's absolutely, as I said, uh, the importance of going out there, testing the market. I think on legal, we're going to see some benefits again, some net benefits uh, to that by going out collectively with other municipalities and, and having a joint uh, process a little bit of the shared services that we're doing uh, in terms of uh, you know is there an opportunity if we had one carrier one provider uh, to have uh, more uh, value and, and and some savings or at least not increases in those particular areas so definitely something that we will be looking at there isn't anything that's a, a large carryover from the previous uh, carrier and the previous administration but I think moving forward uh, there, there may be uh, so I think our goal would be to wrap up those particular uh, files those outstanding matters and cases and then move forward. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think that would be uh, advisable because I think that council shouldn't have to be always looking over their shoulder on these matters and, and to have them at least um, reconciled um, at this point in time would be, uh, would be very prudent. And Mr. Chairman, you may, um, um, the CAO may wish that he hadn't had this conversation with me about 3,000 line items and $100 per for line because, of course, we can figure that one out pretty quickly. So, you know, I, I um, certainly understand where Councillor Mikulik is coming from. And so, you know, there are certain lines that you're not going to be able to touch, like the salaries and, and wages and benefits. But on the other hand, um, I guess, uh, you know, along with the rest of the Council, I would ask that you go back and <clears throat> take a look at those areas where you could shave. Um, $100 doesn't sound like very much. Uh, let's hope that there's uh, more out there than we might uh, think, but um, I'm not sitting here asking you to do that uh, and coming back with any sad stories about um, 
about service impacts because I don't think that's where this community is interested in having us go. So it's going to have to be in efficiencies. So Mr. Chairman, that would be my advice to the CAO. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McCulloch. Uh, thank you once again. Um, just I'm going to get into the weeds a little bit here. I, what, what is this insurance? When do we issue an RFP? Do we tender this? Do we is this automatic? Like we're talking? I don't I don't understand how our current insurance seems to be a significant expense. I'm just I don't even know what it is. But how do we handle that? And at what time of the year does that come up? Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I see Terry uh, wanting to speak to this. So th through the chair, the last time we took it to RFP was about three or four years ago. Um, it automatically, well, it doesn't automatically renew, but we renew it annually. And then after so many years, then we do another RFP and then we bring it back again. So it, it, de it depends. On the so ar arrangement. Just through, through you, Mr. Chair, if I could just add to that. I, I think, Councillor, to, to your point, we've had those same questions around uh, our senior leadership table. Uh, when and how frequent can, should you go out? Can you go out? And I think we are looking at 2020 and going out. Similarly to legal, uh, which is currently out right now, I think we're always looking at, um, you know, are the, are the premiums right? Are we getting value? Uh, there has been a decrease from, from the previous carrier, but I think we always need to be out there testing the market to make sure that uh, can we find a more competitive advantage and competitive rate. And so I think three to four years is typically what you see uh, with a lot of these uh, arrangements, a lot of these contracts, uh, but we will be going out in 2020. Okay, I appreciate that. And the reason why I ask is whenever I've been comfortable with my insurance agent for quite a long time, but whenever I talk about switching carriers, all of a sudden uh, his price came in lower. And uh, I just want to make sure that we're holding them to the fire, that uh, we're willing to walk and find another carrier. That's, that's assuming that we're running a responsible uh, and we're not having too many slip and falls and car accidents. So that's, yeah, if we have a good record in the insurance industry, we should be shopping our good record, so thank you. Councillor Rinchma. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have also a little clarification question about the insurance, because I was going to ask that early on. From what I recall, when we were taught, when the auditor was here before, we have $50 million in liability insurance, and the suggestion was that maybe we don't need that much, and that's a little bit unusual, so I'd asked that question before. And if the savings is, we're hearing uh, through, uh, through uh, finance tonight that the savings isn't um, as much as we might think it might be to reduce that amount, but I would like to hear back what that savings would be. So through the chair, the it would be about $10,000. To bring it down to $30 million? Yeah. Yes, and through the chair, yes. Pardon? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Through the chair, yes. Through the chair, and and so through the chair, um, it, it, is it our understanding that thirty million dollars is sufficient um, amount of liability insurance for us to carry? Do we know that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I mean, I mean, definitely. I think we're hearing the direction this evening. A lot of conversation around insurance. I'd like to go back, and I think we will go back. We will have that conversation. Uh, I mean, as much as we are looking for every dollar, every hundred dollars, every thousand dollars, every ten thousand, um, you know, I, I do want to make sure that if we went from fifty million to thirty million, uh, what is that change in cost, and does that continue to protect us to the level we want to be protected? I think typically, and I was going to make the comment as it relates to a lot of things, whether it be uh, the purchase of uh, supplies, um, whether it be sand, salt. I mean, we, we try to err on the side of being conservative. We can be a little bit more aggressive with those targets, but then you know, one issue, one fall, one you know, major storm, uh, and then we blow through that. So I think there's always that balance with how conservative uh, and how risk adverse can we be, but at the same time wanting to you know, uh, have value and show value. So definitely something we will go away with, Councillor, and come back and provide Council a scenario that looks at if it was 30 million versus 50 million, uh, what does that mean in terms of a premium and the savings on the premium? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillors over there? No? Okay. I've just got a couple, just a couple points, and then we'll wrap this up for this evening. Um, 
I'm pretty, pretty pleased with the living wage we've added to this year's budget. Looking at bringing our crossing guards and museum interpreters and CSRs up to a living wage. And I think that's something that we can be very proud of as a municipality. We can, and, and I know we had talked about this the other night at our review, are, are we the first ones in Niagara to do this? Or, you know, is it, is it something, you know, St. Catharines is the compassionate city, we're the one that's embracing living wage. I, I hope that to be true. Um, the appropriate call-in pay for our firefighters. I think that's a tremendous asset in this year's budget. And, and it's that investing in our people. And if our people feel wanted, then, then one would think that they would, they would do a good job. And, and that shouldn't, pay shouldn't be a motivating factor, but you know what, sometimes it is. Sometimes it's the difference between, you know, you, you hear the commercials on, on the radio and that, between uh, food and hydro and things like that. And we really, really have to have a look. I'm, I'm a, one thing, though, I was looking forward to. You know, we see this uncontrollable versus controllable costs. So, hydro. If hydro is a controllable cost, and this is, I'm going to be a bit, um, different in my way of thinking. So, replacing of decorative street lights are coming in 2022. If hydro is an uncontrollable cost, but we can control it in the purchase of new fixtures, why are we putting that off two years? Why aren't we escalating? Why aren't we increasing that? Why aren't we looking at that next year in 2021? Why aren't we looking at it this year? We know the cost of hydro is going up. So that's something I would challenge staff to look at. Um, you know, the, the landscape services. Got, a, got an email on the weekend about self-watering baskets. If we know that, you know, pressures are operational and, and doing things, we, we've got to start to think outside the box and look at ways to reduce that because the impacts are going to keep coming. We've got the um, we've got the um, the debt financing coming on, and again, this is why I, I preached over and over about looking at a at a multi year budget. So, what are those? What are the things that we're doing this year that might tie our hands next year going forward, or the year after, when we know West Lincoln Memorial Hospital is on the horizon, a new BDSS complex is on the horizon. So. We can't be comfortable, and I don't, don't mean this disrespectfully, but, you know, just because we always do it this way doesn't mean we have to continue to do it this way. You know, looking for something, something different and cutting edge, I'll be the first one to embrace if it gets us to where we want to be. Maybe not this year, but maybe in a year or two or three because we had the foresight to take that leap. Mr. CIO. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, I do want to highlight, uh, and I was going to actually uh, email you back, uh, but you beat me to it, and I think uh, no better place than here to uh, speak to it specifically. Uh, so uh, we were talking over the weekend about those planters. Uh, we currently have 10 in our inventory, uh, and I'm assured by Ms. McKay uh, that uh, Mr. Ward has 20 more on order at the sale price uh, for 2020, so that will put 30 within the realm of our uh, uh, our assets, uh, so we will have 30 of those self-watering planters. I mean, uh, I think uh, we are always looking for those efficiencies. Uh, I know there's a number that uh, you pass on, that councillors pass on, uh, and so we will continue to look for efficiencies like that. Uh, I made a note uh, of the hydro piece specifically to the decorative lighting, something that Director Graham and I can speak about and, and, and update council. Uh, but we are looking at those types of kind of innovative solutions, oh things God, that we I may see. Uh, they are ways that we can look at mitigating costs or keeping costs um, at a level that is appropriate. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I, th I thank Council. I encourage you to keep sharing those things. Um, but I thank you for your support in, in going down that road yeah. uh, in this particular case. It's just because looking at, you know, looking at something like this, it looks daunting. But again, we've got to remember that 1% here is $165,000. And 1% in St. Catharines is a million. And 1% at the region is three. And 1% in in Hamilton is 10. So it has to be an apples to apples comparison or a wine bottle to wine bottle comparison, giving our earlier presentation. So 
Thank you very much, everyone, for your due diligence in, in, in preparing this. And um, so we will receive and file a presentation of the 2020 operating budget review as information. We will require a mover for the motion. Councillor Timmers. All those in favor? Any opposed? And then it's carried. We have no confidential items. I'm, I'm assuming we've, we've uh, evaluated the staff remarks along with committee remarks. So there being fo no further business, I call this meeting adjourned at 10.59. <laughs>